rules are. Uh, yeah, I can put the link to the value statement in the chat. Yeah, and typically in, in my group or this group, um, you know, we just raise our hand. We want to communicate. There's a raise hand feature in the software. If you're on a phone, then um, there's different symbols for having, for raising up, asking questions. So here's our PSEP group rules. There we go. Now it's more visible. Thank you, Claudia. You're welcome. So would you like to uh, read them for us, Claudia? Would that be OK? Yeah, that's fine. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Cool. OK. Um, so first piece of group value is listen effectively and respectfully, share air time, be present and open to new information and perspectives, Assume positive intent, respect each other, respect the group, speak your own truth, communicate directly, honestly, and respectfully, ask questions to clarify, call out bias, be okay with ambiguity. Um, and those are the piece of values. And I'll also put them in the chat for folks if they want to go back and look at them. And um, I will just take this time to also introduce myself. My name is Claudia Claudio. I am the project assistant for PSEP. Thank you guys for being here. And what do you like to do for um, fun, Claudia, that keeps your keeps you healthy? Oh yeah, um, I like to like really take walks um, and just kind of like go explore a different part of like the city. Um, like for example, I live in a new part of Portland now. I live. Um, close to the Hillsville area. So I just been kind of taking walks during my work breaks and just exploring my neighborhood. So it's been really nice. Excellent. Well, I guess I will start off. My name is Amy Anderson. I'm the chair of the Behavioral Health Subcommittee. And lately what I've been doing um, for my activities is going up to Wilson High School at the pool every single weekend, Saturday and Sunday, doing laps, working out. And then my friend um, needed a walking partner. So in the evenings, like three days a week, we go out and walk three to five miles. So yeah, I'm doing a little bit of both and it's kind of whew, more than uh, I did. I did Mount Tabor the other day and she took me up like 60 or 70 steps. And that about, that about made my limit, but I made it up the hill, so. I would, uh, I'm going to pass off the introduction to uh, Judith. You want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, and wow, way to go, Amy. I'm impressed because I also think your job has you on your feet quite a bit. Isn't that right? Um, Eight hours all day, every day. Yeah, um, you're a better woman than I. I my name is Judith Mallory. I am um, uh, some staff support for the PSEP and especially for this committee. And I had a, a really bad accident and had three ankle uh, surgeries two years ago, and I'm still kind of in rehab. So I can't do as much physical things as I really like, but I have been getting out to my garden and um, you know, getting to do a little bit of weeding and working out there. That's what I really love to do most. Um, so that's been fun. And uh, I will pass it off to Celeste. Good evening, everyone. How are you doing? Um, let's see. You wanted to know what we do for fun. Um, I'd say taking pictures and gardening and then DJ. Once in a while, I make it to my radio show. And then sometimes I, I DJ for nonprofit events or at uh, various venues in town. So that's my, that's my relaxation, changing the vibration musically and let's see i'm going to pass it to leo well thank you very much my name is leo harris uh police officer here in the city of portland i work in the training division and right now i'm in charge of the wellness program um, i work for todd tackett who's also on here he's my supervisor and we're excited to be here tonight 
and really appreciate the opportunity. Appreciate all the past work that I know you've all put into uh, making recommendations and thinking about our members' wellness. For fun, I like to go outside. I like to get into the backcountry. I like to hike and fish and do all sorts of things like that and be away from a work phone and the news. And I will pass it on to Todd, because that makes sense. Hello, I'm uh, Todd Tackett. I'm a Sergeant with the Police Bureau and also work out at the training division. I supervise a couple of different programs and one of them is the wellness program. And I just wanna echo uh, what Leo said. I appreciate uh, you all having the interest and desire to uh, make that program even better um, and for giving us some time tonight to educate yourselves on it. Um, as far as for fun, uh, well, I was on vacation the last three weeks and so that was quite a good reset, but um, I have a dog and two kids and so trying to do anything outdoors with them um, is a great reset for me. Um, and on the, uh, since I was gone, uh, Leo has done, uh, as he usually does, most of the work um, in this. So I'll just kind of jump in when I can and stuff, but um, I'm gonna turn this, uh, I think, over to Chase, since he's next to me on the screen. Hey, I'm Chase Bryson. <clears throat> I'm the Crisis Intervention Team Coordinator for the Police Bureau up in BHU. Um, for me, I think uh, just going outside and relaxing. I'm not a big like go on a big hike or backpacking. When I'm like off, I want to like sit down and relax and just hang out, um, not work more, um, but teach their own. And then we recently got paddle boards. So uh, I'm not an expert by any means, but that's been fun to learn. Uh, Nathan, have you gone? I don't think so. Yeah, I can go quickly. I am a uh, just a community member here to watch um, watch the show. Uh, I also serve on TAC, but I'm not here officially in that capacity right now. Um, and for summer activities, um, I, I mean, it's an all-year activity. I really like going for long walks and seeing, uh, seeing the city, seeing the sights, and uh, exploring. Uh, did Barb go? Not yet, but the mic's on and she's ready to go. Yes, she is. She's coordinating video and audio, I guess. Hi, my name is Barb Rainish. I use she, her pronouns. I am not a member of the PSAP, but I am a member of the Behavioral Health Subcommittee. Um, and honestly, the best thing I've been doing most leisurely this summer is going with my friend Amy to the Wilson Pool as often as I can hook up with her. So probably about half the amount of time that she goes. But yeah. it's, it's really nice and really relaxing. And I wouldn't do it if I wasn't doing it like partnered up. And that's weird for me because I usually don't care and I'll, you know, do whatever on my own. So I'm going to pass it to Mary Claire. Thank you, Barb. Uh, Mary Claire Buckley from the Portland Police Bureau. And uh, we ought to start a club. I uh, also like to. Uh, walk. I'm not a runner, but a walker I always have been. And um, have uh, in the household a uh, little French bulldog, so it makes sure that I get out every day at least a couple of times for walk. So it's good. Um, I will pass to Tia. Hey, hi, I'm Tia Telefox. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a alternative, alternative volunteer for PSAP on the Behavioral Health Subcommittee. I also volunteer at the Rahab Sisters working with unhoused community members as a resource guide and um, greeter. I, for fun, I, I have a disability, so I'm working really hard on my balance, walking and hiking. I'm up to nine, nine miles a week now. Um, and new to Portland, so I've been discovering new hikes. I like road trips. I just went to a concert. I really like music. 
because there are things I like to do for fun. Oh, I need to scroll through my screen to see who. Tara Candela. Hello, I am Tara Candela. This is my first um, attendance at any meetings. Um, I am a psychiatric nurse. I worked at Unity for two and a half years and I just put in notice my last day will be on the 14th because I'm also a new psych NP and I am a member of Mental Health Alliance. Um, so, like I said, this is my first community meeting and to de-stress, I also like to walk. It's the absolute truth. I like to go to like Jenkins estate or some of the other parks and any place that has like flowers or anything that I can look at. And I usually take a bunch of pictures with my phone and then immediately upload them to Facebook. So I need to stop doing the uploading until I actually leave the park because <laughs> it kind of takes away from the experience of checking out, so to speak. And then the other thing that I really, really like to do is play with my dogs. They really, really are um, good for my emotional health. I'm instantly like soothed and happy when I'm playing with them because they're always pretty much happy to see me. So thank you. Is there anyone else? Um. My memory's not that good. <laughs> Natalie, Natalia? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, yeah, I'm Natalia. Um, I have attended a few um, PSET meetings. Um, this is my first one in a while. Um, I am also a TIP volunteer, um, and I'm actually trying to attend two Zoom meetings at the same time right now. <laughs> so, um, um, I, this is my second time attending the TIP CE meeting that we have today. I did it this morning, but I'm doing it again. So anyway, so I'm mostly here, but if you see me looking off, um, that's what's happening. <laughs> um, and what was the question, the introduction question? What do you do to keep yourself, uh, like fun and, and relaxed? Like you're running two Zoom meetings. That's gotta be a lot on the brain. What do you do to relax? <laughs> Yeah, um, I love going swimming, swimming in the Columbia. Her. Yeah. In the river proper? I'm impressed. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, okay, well, um, since it's hard for everyone to see everyone, um, Jared, would you like to go next? Oh, I'm happy to go. I'm his spouse. I'm here listening in as a community member. My name is Elizabeth Scarborough. I go by she or they. And for fun to de-stress, I'm a big fiction reader. And I'll pass it to Jared. Hi, uh, Jared Hager with the Department of Justice. I'm here in my role as the monitor of the settlement agreement between the United States and the city of Portland. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. And my de-stressor is uh, crossword puzzles. I like the New York Times crossword, I do it daily. And now they got this new game called uh, Queen Bee. Uh, so just puzzling helps keep me relaxed. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to the discussion on wellness. And I think Anika, you, you would be our final recipient. Hello. Hi, good evening. My name is Anika Bent Albert. I'm a deputy city attorney uh, for the city of Portland and a liaison attorney for PSEP. Um, I believe the question is what you do to have fun, be stressed, relax. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I think these days, probably some, I'm doing a certified native habitat gardening situation, and I'm not any form of garden gardener. So uh, it's been a, an interesting process and also do some light exercising, some bar three, but that's about it and chase my children around. <laughs> well, that's exercise for sure. Well, thank you. I think everyone is gone. If you haven't, let me know. Um, wonderful things we all like to do. Amazing walking was never my favorite subject until recently. Lately, I've been cracking about 30 miles a week. So, yeah. 
it's quite a bit. <laughs> but um, we're going to go ahead and turn the meeting over to our guest speakers. Um, Officer Harris on the subject of Portland Police Bureau's wellness program. Take it away. Thank you very much. Um, probably seen it several times. Thank you for having us. We're excited to talk with you all and talk about the recommendations that you all have made in the past. Some of you might have been there for that. Some of you might not. Um, I do have a, a PowerPoint that I put together to try to outline some of the things. Um, I know that you all were interested in our EAP program also. Um, unfortunately, because of the funeral today in Vancouver, um, Amy Bruner Dennert couldn't be here because um, she was dealing with the AP stuff related to that. Um, so Todd and Mai's plan is to talk about wellness first, um, talk about the recommendations you all made in the past. We'll give you uh, some exposure into where we're at now. We've been up and running for a little over two years. And then we'll talk a little bit about EAP at the end. If uh, you want more information about EAP or you really want to talk to Amy, then um, we will schedule another meeting and have her come out. Um, I see that someone said in the chat, could you share the PowerPoint with us? Yes, we can send that to someone um, at the end, um, maybe to um, Barb or whoever can send it to everyone. Um, I'm good with uh, people just piping up or raising hands or whatever. If you have questions about something that's pertinent um, right in the moment, more than happy to talk about it. And if not, we'll certainly have hopefully time at the end, unless I talk forever, um, time at the end to do question and answer. So feel free to um, stop me at any point. I did go ahead and give you a uh, share screen capability. So you should be able to share that PowerPoint. Awesome. Thank you very much. Can people see that? Yes. Excellent. Um, I won't go too in depth on officers wellness right now, but as many of you have probably heard or can imagine, it is uh, definitely a challenge to be in charge of a wellness program. <laughs> um, it's every day. Our members get some kind of news, maybe it's bad or maybe it's just new news, right? Some type of change uh, and that can be really challenging for folks. So it'll be interesting to see you know, how effective we are. We think we're doing a good job. We think we're on the right track. Um, it'll be really good to get info or you know, feedback from you all, uh, but it's definitely been a challenge. Um, we'll talk about some of those throughout, but it's not something I'm gonna really talk through a whole bunch. Um, obviously, Danielle Outlaw was the chief in 2019. Um, there was a push from the PSEP and also a push from our training advisory council to move forward and make more progress on officer wellness. And we really appreciated that. That's obviously something that's been on people in the Bureau's mind. It used to fall entirely to the EAP program. And uh, there's a different coordinator uh, back then and they really worked hard. Um, his name was Mike. They did the best they could, but in some ways, how we view EAP and wellness, wellness is a little more like the preventative medicine, preventative measures, things that you would try to do to avoid catastrophe, try to maintain your health and mental well-being. And EAP, a lot of times, is what we use for more of the emergency room or some kind of problem has developed or there's an officer-involved shooting or something that is an immediate thing that you have to go take care of. Um, I'll talk a little bit more at the end about peer support and some other things related to uh, EAP. But first, we'll just talk about wellness. Like I said, we use that as the preventative side of things. Um, first thing I wanted to talk about was for anybody that missed it or maybe wasn't on PSEP at that point was the four recommendations that we got from PSEP related to wellness. Uh, they were a little bit long, so I don't have them all outlined on the screen. I'll probably read them, though. Um, I don't want there to be some nuanced part of it that someone finds really important and I don't have it captured here. Don't respond to it or say, yeah, we've uh, implemented that, you know, if we haven't. So number one, I'll just read. Um, PSEP recommends that PPB partner with researchers to determine effective scheduling practices as a part of a holistic approach to officers wellness. This can help minimize the role that shift work can play in sleep disorders and associated physical and psychological ailments. PSEP recognizes the challenge posed by current staffing to improve scheduling practices and urges the city council to consider wellness factors when determining appropriate staffing levels to the context of the city's other priorities. Uh, we appreciated all of that. 
Um, think there's a lot of interesting good stuff in there that obviously would benefit our members. That was written, I think, in 2019, and staffing was a problem then. And I think now we're down 200 more officers or so, somewhere in that neighborhood. And I think staffing is obviously an even bigger issue now. The other issue with working on something related to scheduling or schedules, shift work, um, is the different unions than things like that that would have to be bargained um, during collective bargaining. So sleep, I think, is the main intent there. Um, they want cops who are well rested, who can serve the community effectively. Sleep pretty much affects everything. Um, we think it's absolutely one of the foundations for um, wellness. And I'll talk a little bit later, but we are working on a, on a comprehensive sleep program that will uh, potentially involve Washington State University and OHU, OHSU, maybe some sleep studies for members, and then some classes and training on sleep and how important it is and ways to get them better sleep and to monitor their sleep. So in some ways it might not be re uh, implemented right this second, but I think we're definitely on track to work on sleep as an issue. Is there anybody that has any questions on sleep or recommendation number one before I move on to number two? All right, I'll move on to number two, which is uh, focused on fitness, another one of the uh, very important parts of overall physical wellness, something that we all talked about at the beginning, almost everybody at the beginning when they talked about what they do to unwind and try to maintain their sanity, um, talked about things that involve fitness. So that's obviously a key. So it reads, PSEP recommends that PPB establish incentives and an education program promoting physical fitness, which can improve officer health outcomes and reduce costs for agencies. Physical fitness is associated with fewer sick days, lower rates of disability, fewer injuries within departments. And researchers have noted the even marginal gains of fitness can yield substantial fitness benefits. As fitness is necessary foundation for effective policing, we recommend that the fitness component be integrated into officer schedules consistent with existing practices at the Portland Fire Bureau and other police departments nationwide. We definitely appreciated that uh, recommendation. Uh, one of the first things we did, and we'll talk about it more, is do a survey of all of our members and find out what they wanted from a wellness program since it was new. And I think about a 90% um, response rate said they wanted to do some type of fitness during work hours. So that's something we'll discuss later, but we have implemented that not in a permanent fashion. It's uh, more of a pilot project at this point, and we'll talk more about that soon. Does anybody have any questions about the fitness recommendation? All right, moving on to number three. PSEP recommends that PPB establish a training program aimed at reducing stress and promoting officer resilience. Uh, psychosociological intervention program built on the trauma resilience model has shown to improve officers use of force decision making in a shoot don't shoot exercise when researcher researchers hypothesize as a result of enhanced physiological control and situational awareness mindfulness skills are also associated with promising wellness outcomes in officers and we agree with a lot of that um, down the road, we will talk about some of the classes that we put on related to stress and resilience and also to mindfulness. And obviously we want uh, officers that are self-aware and very mindful um, when they show up to serve the community so that they're in a good frame of mind, they're making good decisions and these other things, um, sleep, fitness, nutrition, all those types of things. The other um, things that uh, put pressure on folks aren't impacting them when they're at work trying to make decisions that might have um, really serious consequences. Any questions about number three? I see a hand raised. Yeah, Amy here. I do have a question. You kind of inspired my thought around um, like mindfulness classes and I call it um, alternative, um, you know, like health options. My question is, does the insurance that is offered for folks cover like gym memberships? Does it cover um, complementary work like physical therapy or acupuncture or anything else that might be um, considered different, I guess, from the norm? Uh, I don't know that I'm going to have the best answer for you. I think generally, yes. Um, if people have some kind of ailment, I know I've gotten 
acupuncture. I know I've had lots of physical therapy for injuries. We have our own insurance uh, through Moda that is good health insurance. So officers definitely have that available to them. Um, obviously, um, counseling, things like that, the city does pay for through Cascade. Um, they get 13 or more free um, sessions. And obviously, a lot of members have gone through their own private insurance through Moda, um, which there's a deductible at some point throughout the year. And once they reach that, then it's a substantially reduced rate. So yes, a lot of those things are covered. Um, we don't cover gym memberships at this point. There are other places that can sometimes through the union do it. Um, I know that it gets tricky when you're dealing with folks trying to um, either give some kind of benefit or some kind of reduced rate, or even just having the city pay for a membership somewhere. Um, but those are things that I know that the city of Portland is looking into with their city wellness committee, um, which we're on. So we try to keep on top of those conversations. Most of our precincts and a lot of our building facilities have gyms. And so uh, people can come to work and either outside of work hours, work out, and then sometimes on a limited basis, work out during work hours. And we'll talk about that a little bit more down the road. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds like they've got quite a bit of choice. That's good. They do. And choice is definitely a good thing. Anybody else? We'll move on to number four. Leo, yeah, there was a question I think someone asked about Cascadia. And I think to clarify, uh, Cascade Centers is what Leo was referring to. It's a company here in Portland that the city um, contracts with to offer uh, the main thing they offer is counseling services, but they also offer life coaching and they have a, a whole bunch of different uh, products that they offer any city employee. Um, and that's the Cascade that Leo was talking about. So not Cascadia. So. Thank you for that. All right, number four that PPB engage a wide range of communities regarding wellness practices, including tribal councils in the Portland metro region. Uh, we've done a little bit of this, um, but not a lot. And we have not reached out to uh, tribal councils in the Portland metro region. Don't have any connections there yet, but we're looking forward to doing that. Uh, Theo has reached out to us through Jay Bates and I reached out to him and haven't heard back, but we are looking forward to maybe meeting with him and seeing what kind of options there are out there um, there's nothing that we wouldn't look at as far as trying to get our members um, some additional wellness training initiatives, ideas, um, doesn't matter what it is. So we're very open to that. Um, and we've definitely engaged some communities, but not all. Any questions hey, or thoughts? Real quick, have you heard of the Future Generations Collaborative? It's huge. It's no. a huge native um, organization here in town. It's called the Future Generations Collaborative. And um, I do know someone big in the system, and she works for the county, Charmaine Kinney, um, or she works for Care Oregon now. But she's native and could really help you navigate some of those connections if you want. But Very I know cool. Thank you. Gener yeah. Generations Collaborative, yeah. Thank you very much. We'll look into that. I appreciate that. If there's nothing else, I will move Tia on. Had a, sorry, Tia had a question in chat. It's coming. Go ahead. About, she wanted to know who was providing the mindfulness class. Ah, yes, we will get to that. We will get to that. Um, his name is Tim Musgrave, and uh, I will talk a little bit more about him as we move. Thank you. Absolutely. I am having an issue with my screen is not moving the slides ahead. Let me see if I can stop sharing and start sharing again. See if it's
we go. All right. If there's no questions, sorry about that. Sometimes this laptop does some things on its own. So to start out with just a little bit of history, uh, after we talked about your recommendations, we started in March of 2019. I was the lucky person to get chosen from a wide range of people to put in to be the first wellness program coordinator. Um, felt very lucky to take that on. Prior to that, I had been in the training division and I had been in charge of the patrol tactics program, uh, teaching active shooter and um, traffic stops, things like that. So this was definitely a big change. Um, very fun to start trying to implement a uh, new program from the ground up. Obviously a lot of challenges, um, one of which we'll talk about later. We don't really have our own budget. Um, so always trying to figure out, you know, ways to pay for stuff. Um, but we'll start with uh, the PPB definition of wellness it is the state of being where a person is thriving physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, and financially. And our goal is to help um, promote behavior change um, by helping our members build and maintain healthy habits related to fitness, sleep, nutrition, mental health, and finances. And in there, it says personal behavior change, because one of the things that's really challenging about wellness and even EAP, any help that we try to give to our members is really information, encouragement, things like that. But a lot of times they have to be the ones that are ready and willing to make the change or implement that habit or maintain that um, action until it becomes a habit. And so that's definitely a challenge. Um, everyone with the best of intentions uh, tries to take good care of themselves, me included. And I know that there are things that I don't do well enough or often enough um, that I'd be better and healthier overall if I did them more. So that's our goal with our members. And we wanted to do that through motivating them, training them, and then also through removing barriers. I know something that comes up pretty frequently is that cops don't like to ask for help or don't like to appear weak. Um, I do think there's some truth to that, although uh, I've been here for 19 years and I definitely feel like that is um, becoming less and less of an obstacle. I think folks feel, I think our members feel uh, safe and um, willing to ask for help when, when necessary. Some of them do, not all of them, but I, I definitely think we are trending in the right direction. Um, we get to see through the EAP and the cascade connection, the amount of usage from our members, and we get to see when it trends up and down. And so I know that there are folks um, reaching out for help. And sometimes it would probably surprise people how many uh, of our members are out reaching out for help. Uh, we want to get them as much training and motivation as possible. Um, and this starts from when they get hired and they go through our advanced academy. Uh, members have to come back every year for a 40 hour in service somewhere in that neighborhood. And uh, we've been very lucky so far. We've been able to do wellness classes each time. I think the 2020 in service, we started off each day with an hour wellness class um, with a variety of different topics, which I'll talk about later. And then last but not least, we are trying to implement, and we'll talk more about it, a wellness training time um, for about an hour during their day at work. So I already said this, but our, our first thing we wanted to do when we started was see what folks wanted because we didn't know what they wanted. I didn't want to assume that I knew what they wanted or what they needed. A lot of it did fall right in line with things that Todd and I wanted to do. Uh, we sent out a survey. Um, I don't know if I explained this already, but our program is geared towards all police bureau members. So it's not just for sworn police officers. Um, it's also for our professional staff. And that can be challenging. There's uh, two or three different unions that we have to navigate. Uh, there's a lot of different responsibilities at jobs and a lot of different time constraints and different staffing levels. But that's our goal is to help all members, professional staff and sworn members um, with their wellness. So we sent out a survey uh, to about 1200 folks got about a 50% um, response rate, 600 people. And they um, about 90% said they wanted fitness during work hours and yoga mobility stretching was about an 80% what they wanted. And then meditation during work hours was actually at about 70%. That was one of the ones meditation I was probably the most concerned about. I thought uh, or nervous about because I felt like cops might be really hesitant to do it. And it didn't seem like it was going to be as big of an issue. We uh, finally did do a meditation class, which I'll talk more about later. It was well received. Um, and I meditate frequently and enjoy it. And so I definitely have been uh, known to be trying to push it um, since becoming affiliated with the uh, wellness program. 
after that, our next move was to go meet with all the different um, organizations within our organization. So the Portland Police Bureau is broken up into divisions. And a lot of times they're in charge of a lot of different things on their own. Um, each precinct uh, might be ran a little bit differently or an entire um, division like TOD or the training division or the traffic division, things like that. So we went and met with them and we helped them create their own committees. One of the issues that we had, we could not get um, approval or the authority to push the same thing across the board uh, at every division. And so even working towards uh, trying to get an hour per day for wellness training time, some of the RUs, we call them RUs. If you don't know what that is, I think it's a responsibility unit. Each of the RUs was not able to give an hour per day for each member. And we're definitely working towards that. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but we needed each RU to be in charge of and have the responsibility to be in charge of their own committee, figure out what their own groups wanted, um, what kind of priorities they wanted, and after that, we started trying to implement that. The wellness training time allows members to have whatever the set time is um, to work on areas of fitness, um, learn about sleep, uh, nutrition, diet, emotional health, finances. Um, we wanted members to be able to make telehealth visits or go set up appointments with mental health counselors um, during that time or to be able to just focus on fitness and they come back into wherever they work and use the gym. A lot of, of the RUs in the different divisions were able to give one hour. And so some members were able to get four or uh, one hour per day, four days per week, because they work four tens. Um, some of the other RUs were only able to provide one hour every other day. So they got it two days per week. And then there were some other RUs that got even less than that. Um, what that did allow us to do was be able to gather data and try to figure out the different impacts from having four days per week versus two days per week versus less than that, um, see how it impacted our members. There are a lot of different things that we wanted to uh, tabulate and try to see if complaints went down or up, um, injuries went down or up, lawsuits, uh, sick time, all those different types of metrics. And obviously, as you all know, 2020 was a hard year to try to compare data to all those categories related to wellness and having to go up or down with the protest related uses of force and complaints and lawsuits. Um, it was definitely a challenge to try to figure out how the wellness program had impacted positively the, those different uh, categories. We know that all those areas are areas that impact our members and they impact their ability to serve their community and their coworkers and their families. Like I said before, we want mindful self-aware cops who are well-rounded and healthy in all those areas showing up to work to do their work. Um, we collected data um, as a baseline and then at a six month and a one year mark, uh, we should have a one year report coming out at some point soon where we try to um, quantify all of that. One of our um, training division analyst is working on that right now. So hopefully at some point soon we'll have that and we'll be able to show that to uh, people if you're interested. Are there any questions before I move on? Any questions about the um, wellness training time before I move on to the other projects we took on? Um, right. I have a question. Um, Go I am a certified teacher and um, have some multicultural counseling training also. And uh, I'm so excited to hear that they're doing mindfulness training and yoga and things like that. Um, I find it really personally valuable and also valuable for the community. But um, gosh, I'm curious, is there any way that I can be a part of it and offer my skills with the programs that you're launching now? Um, who can I contact? Uh, contact me. And we will look uh, into that. Very interesting. Would love to have community members be able to help us out. One of the things that has been interesting for Sergeant Tackett and I is navigating people wanting to help. There have been a lot of people that have offered to help. A lot of people have offered their services for a fee, which totally is fine and makes sense also. Um, and it is challenging. We have not necessarily perfected our, um, our vetting process yet for how we would take um, a vendor, how we would vet them, uh, make sure that they are competent and culturally, um, and then also um, 
and I'm not a fiscal expert, um, and I'm not even saying that you are looking to do it for a fee, but just explaining to other folks some of our challenges. Um, we're supposed to put things out for bid, and it's definitely challenging if you know there's a lot of yoga instructors or a lot of mindfulness instructors who would love to come and do it. Um, and so how would you pick? Um, and so that's definitely been a challenge for us, but we look forward to it. We absolutely want to be able to include community members who are interested in helping our members. So we appreciate your um, interest and I'll uh, get in touch with you. Yeah, Leo, a question. Um, on your wellness training, is that to teach the officers about the different categories that you were talking about like like diet and nutrition and you know that kind of stuff are you actually talking about trainings or are you talking about them actually doing something about it that's a really great question um so two separate things um our goal is to get them as much training and information as possible but wellness training time that they're allowed uh per day our hope is they use that to actually incorporate some of that take a class on finances, take a class on nutrition, um, practice mindfulness, practice yoga, or practice fitness. So yes, um, that they're two separate things. The in-service training, the advanced academy training, all that is hopefully training them how to do it. And then the, the time per day is hopefully where they get to work on it. And um, to answer your earlier question about vetting professionals, okay, um, there's a lot of individuals in this community who have been in practice 30, 40 years that would make excellent like uh, people to interview people with. Uh, you know, I, we could all line you up with some of the long timers that have been doing different practices in Portland and they could help you determine who's the best candidate because of their expertise in certain fields. So I would use the best of the best in the field you're looking for to be sort of like the um, reviewers of those applying, you know? Um, and I know several folks as well who have been in this practice of alternative medicine wellness for decades that, you know, could easily help you navigate these questions. So Very cool. at least three or four major schools of acupuncture in Portland, over 900 people ready to be, you know, like used or, 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 you know, entered into the system. They just, it's hard to make those connections. So feel free to email me too. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Did Barb have her hand raised? Okay, Barb has, yes. Barb's question is, <clears throat> a little bird has told me that Hillsboro police have a really good meditation program. And I'm wondering if you guys have ever, if you guys reciprocity wise have talked about, you know, with other local jurisdictions and found out how to copy what they already have going on as well. Uh, we have, um, we talked to Hillsboro. Um, we know the Lieutenant that started that and have had several meetings. Um, he's offered to have uh, Portland members involved in some of the studies that they're trying to do. It hasn't totally worked out. Some of them were pretty long-term comprehensive studies, which were awesome. Uh, we did have members that, that wanted to participate. Part of the issue was scheduling and timing. Um, they had very specific dates and times that members had to show up, and there was no way to have our members do that, uh, depending on the different shifts that they work and hours and all that stuff, and whether it was going to be during work hours or not. Um, they were kind of the pioneers of a lot of the police wellness stuff and then specifically the meditation. And so, yes, we've definitely talked to them. Um, they do have some training courses that we've looked into, timing of it, finances, all that hasn't necessarily worked out. Um, but yes, uh, I appreciate the, the recommendation and the thought of uh, not recreating the wheel, going places where they've already done it and they've already implemented it and they've probably already uh, dealt with a lot of problems. So very good question. Anybody else? I have a question. Go ahead. Um, I see it's a one-year pilot that started in 2019, 2020, so it's really tough as we all know. And so when is the one-year pilot project over? Is it over or is it still going? It is pretty much finishing up for everyone. 
Um, the way that we started it, um, I don't know what you would call it, a shotgun start. Everybody starts at different times. Yeah. Uh, okay. We ended up having uh, some of the RUs that we met with ready to go much sooner, had their plan drafted. Some of them were six months and even more later than other groups. So it was a year pilot project for each group, but they weren't all finished at the same time. And so then the right. report is trying to tabulate all of that um, with different start stop times. So hopefully by the uh, end of the summer, maybe we'll end up having a report done on the whole project. Okay. And so the second question is, um, once you see how much impact it made, will you continue doing the wellness program? Yes. So the pilot project is, is only related to the um, wellness training time during work hours. So I think it was recommendation number three from PSEP, um, which we really appreciated. Um, I know the fire bureau does an hour per day for every member. Um, that's something that is bargained into their contract. I believe they've been doing that for a long, long time, which is great. We absolutely hope to do that. Um, we personally feel that one hour per day for every member would probably be um, end up showing the biggest impact for members wellness. Um, but there's a lot of things to juggle, you know, and that's Todd and my hope and obviously Amy's, but you know, we're not the, in the chief's office. We're not trying to figure out staffing and call loads and call times and things like that. So I know there's a lot of other factors at play. Um, and obviously that's something that you all, um, have the ability to weigh in on as far as like importance level as community members, um, as far as wellness times during work hours. I mean, it's, it's not an easy task trying to figure out how to go serve these members of the community that have called 911 and need something right away. You know, and we have members out of service working on their wellness, which is obviously important. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but, you know, it's not lost on us that that's not, that's not an easy thing to figure out. That makes sense. So yes, we're keeping going with the wellness program regardless. Um, and we're hoping to keep going with the uh, wellness training time during work hours. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Some of the other things we did, um, Portland, the police bureau has always had a wellness or a fitness committee um, for the gyms. They take care of all the different equipment, things like that. Um, it was uh, under the chief's office. We ended up incorporating that into the training division and the wellness program so that we can help manage that. Uh, we tried to get a you know, wide range of views on where we should go with the wellness program. So we created a, a wellness advisory council. We've not met very many times. Most of the members um, are going to need to be replaced. Um, but that's something that we wanted to start with so that everybody was represented, all of our professional staff and our um, sworn staff and the chief's office and fiscal. Um, we're all a part of that group. We also joined the city of Portland wellness steering committee. Um, and uh, Joel and Courtney over at the City of Portland um, Wellness Program have done a great job trying to uh, move the city as a whole forward. Um, I know every city employee has probably had their wellness impacted by the last year or two between COVID and everything else. Um, we added the ability to use Cascade Services. They have an app that our members, that some of our members really like called Whole Life Directions. Um, and one of the issues was originally you had to do it on your work phone, uh, but there were questions in it related to sleep and stress and alcohol use and other things. And we were concerned and we'd heard from members, they weren't willing to put that type of information into their work phone. Uh, and so it took a lot of effort. Um, Joel Michaels, who's the occupational safety and health nurse for the city of Portland did a lot of work on it. And we did a lot of work on uh, making it something that was an option to do on your personal phone. And we had to figure out how to still pay Cascade, um, but then have that as, a, as a, an option for members so that they could be um, feel comfortable being upfront and honest about things that might be impacting their wellness. Uh, we also built an internal wellness website. Um, it's not something that's open to the public. Um, you have to be on a bureau device to access it. It's just on a SharePoint site. And that's something that members can use during their wellness training time or any other time on a bureau device to look at. Um, it's all open source information. Um, uh, myself and other folks trying to find um, relevant um, stress, nutrition, fitness uh, information, and then putting it all in one place that they can go look at. Um, yoga videos. Um, so like say during their wellness training time, they find a place, especially during COVID when our gyms were closed, 
try to go find a quiet place with no one else around. And then even just using their bureau work phone, they could go to the wellness website. And I had links to um, different uh, yoga videos that were good, especially for beginners. Another thing we can do is provide one minute wellness emails, um, which just go out to all members. Um, sometimes their motivation, sometimes their perspective. Um, most members have enjoyed that. We've gotten feedback from some members that they don't appreciate it, um, but had a, a overwhelming response that people do enjoy having an occasional um, encouraging reminder here and there. Mary Claire's even given me some feedback. <laughs> Those quotes. <laughs> All right, moving on. Um, so these are some of the trainings that we've incorporated. Uh, these were initially provided at in-service for all of our members that were coming through the 40 hour training. We did one of these classes each morning, not the finance class, but the top four. And now we've incorporated all of those into our advanced academy for our new brand new hire police officers who come from the basic academy back to us. Um, there's a heart health class, obviously cardiac uh, issues have been a problem for policing for a long time. There's a lot of different studies that show police officers are much more likely to have a, some kind of cardiac event much earlier in their life um, than other people in the population. Um, there's a lot of um, information, anecdotal, and also studies about police officers passing away much sooner into retirement. And we've actually had um, pretty recently two police bureau members retire from the police bureau and then have a heart attack and pass away in the last couple of years. So that was definitely on everyone's mind. So that class was appreciated and um, well attended. Uh, there's a nutrition class from Michelle, Michelle Teagan Camp. Um, she's a nutritionist for the Blazers. And she also works with Ryan Bogus and HQPT, the uh, physical therapist um, group that we we're using. Uh, Drew Prokniak, um, who's a local mental health provider um, somebody that has an open practice. Many police officers see him well-respected and appreciated, came and gave some several different classes on stress and resilience. Someone asked earlier who taught our mindfulness and meditation. And so far it's been Tim Musgrave. He was a police officer here in the city of Portland. He paid a lot of money and put himself through the um, program, to become a certified uh, mindfulness coach through the University of California at San Diego. And he's also um, graduated from MPEAK. And initially, part of it was related to finances. We didn't have a lot of money. We could get Tim because he worked for the police bureau and he was certified for free to come do it. And so that was something that we use. Now we're moving forward. Um, we might end up switching and using somebody else. He's since retired from the bureau, um, but he was well received. Like I said, I was nervous. I was telling Todd and some of our other bosses, if we even get like a 20 or 30% approval rating for the mindfulness class, I'll be very happy. Um, I think that's one of the most beneficial things to people in general, but especially police officers. And so I was thinking even a 30% approval rating would be progress. And I am happy to report it was closer to 70% overall for the Bureau as they came through. It's definitely not everybody's thing. We still hear from uh, lots of members that they don't like it or makes them feel too relaxed if they do it before their shift. Some people really enjoy doing it after their shift. Um, I've been doing it long enough that I think you can do it anytime during your shift or others. Um, and I know there's plenty of bureau members that are um, in the same page, on the same page. Um, but it's been a, a slow but steady increase in the number of members that are telling us that they try it, enjoy it, like it. Um, we want it to be something that is an option for members when they are going through stressful times personally, work-wise, doesn't matter. Last but not least, finances. Finances uh, can definitely be um, an issue for anyone, um, and certainly police officers and uh, our professional staff are no different. Um, I don't know if I can admit Anna. Do people want me to admit Anna if that's possible? I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, so Neil Parker and also FPDNR have put on a couple of financial classes um, related to simple budgeting, things like that. Um, I know for, for myself, um, I came to the police bureau and it was uh, my first major job. I made more money than I'd made before. And I would have definitely benefited from a budgeting class. And um, so our members have appreciated that and also a retirement class so that they can really kind of prepare and um, financially be ready for retirement. Any questions about any of those classes that we've implemented for 
all of our members. Uh, I do have one question. Um, I do hear you saying that it's relatively new and that you're getting good approval rates. And I also hear that it's not available at the same levels for everyone. But I'm really curious as to what is your participation rates, your participation levels. Uh, are you finding that you're getting close to that 100% that you want or uh, are you finding that maybe you're not getting quite there? And, and if you're not quite there, um, when the, you are getting feedback or people sharing why they can't participate at a level that would, would uh, give you overall satisfaction. Yes, very good question. I appreciate that. I should have already covered that, so thank you. Um, some of the topics are mandatory. So these classes that you're seeing here are mandatory. So all members got those. Uh, the other things that we were talking about, the wellness training time during their work hours, that is all optional. And so there are some members that don't take advantage of it. Um, there's a variety of reasons. Some people don't want to work out or meditate or do something in front of other people. Some people would prefer to do it at home or their own gym. Um, there are some staffing issues. There are people, so in the one hour that you get, you have to get to wherever you're gonna work out, change out of your uniform if it's one of the sworn members, go do some kind of workout, shower, get back in uniform and go back to work in an hour. And so that has been a barrier for some people, especially people that like to work out already, but they have a set routine and they wanna do you know, some kind of CrossFit workout or something and it might take longer than that. They can't be back in time. They don't wanna just do something simple. We've really tried to encourage people even to just walk on the treadmill for 30 minutes or sit in their car in a safe place and meditate or, you know, make a mental health um, appointment, things like that. So we do in all of the surveys for the um, wellness training time, the baseline, the six month and the one year, the project is, that is getting analyzed right now did take into account all the different barriers for why people um, did participate or didn't participate. So that is something we will be able to read about. Great, thank you. Thank you, great question. All right, moving on, if there's uh, no other questions. Uh, we do track and we do um, care very much about the feedback, um, but it's, it's always challenging. Any of you that have any experience getting feedback, you have to be very careful. Um, it's interesting and easy to get wrapped up around some really negative feedback. I remember one in particular related to like the heart health class. Overwhelmingly, the feedback was great. And we did get one or two that were very negative. And a lot of times that's from members whose wellness in that area is already very high. And they felt like it didn't challenge them. They didn't learn anything. And so we have to just sit back and think, okay, it was a mandatory class. We knew we made them go. We wanted that to be a baseline class for everyone. And we just have to take the, the negative feedback if it's because it wasn't hard enough or didn't teach them enough, just with a grain of salt. But in general, all members felt like the wellness classes um, were definitely relevant to them personally. So moving on from there, we kind of moved into 2020 and a lot of things that we had going were kind of put on hold. There were definitely time periods where nobody was getting their wellness time during the day. Um, everyone in the training division was out working protests and doing other things. And so there definitely was some periods where not a lot of things happened other than protest management for the whole bureau. Um, at the end of that, uh, there was definitely a lot of members that were very broken and wellness levels and morale levels, as you can all imagine, were pretty low. Um, there was, there were members who by the end, you know, the, the field that they enjoyed working in, whether it was, um, the traffic division or the canine unit or a neighborhood response team or a school resource officer or some of the gun violence reduction officers. Um, they had gotten to a unit that they really wanted to be in. Um, that was where they put their energy and their time. They were making contacts with people, building relationships and Looks like Leo's frozen. 
I see Tia's moving. So other people are here, right? It's not me. Yeah, I'm still here. I'm here. Great. I think he'll be coming back. Yeah, I think Rune should all be here. Ah, Zoom. <laughs> That's certainly one thing we don't have to deal with in person is suddenly disappearing. Yeah. Was I we lost you. Did I get kicked out? Stayed? Yeah, it was you. Everybody uh, else stayed. <laughs> no, I got it. We others got kicked out. I got oh funny. Oh, weird. Well, welcome back. Um, you, know, <laughs> you were right on the brink of talking about folks who had, you know, really worked toward being in the place they wanted to be in the bureau, either uh, gun violence reduction or um, in the school, school resource system. officers. Yeah, and so like I said, uh, Todd and I don't have an opinion on whether or not that was good or bad. Um, that just is, you know, what it is. Um, things happen in different professions, and we all need to be um big enough and smart enough to just move on with it but it was definitely a challenge we had a lot of members coming to work that were now working different hours had different days off working around different um, co-workers and doing a totally different type of police work that they weren't expecting to be doing and um i think morale was pretty low i think some of our survey results definitely showed that um amy uh, bruner dinner who is our eap coordinator came up with an idea um, she served in the military for a long time and she knew that when officers came back from uh, or when uh, military members came back from deployments, they had a restoration type project or a reintegration project or a time period where they could um, kind of get back to normal before they went home to their families. And um, we obviously weren't able to make it that big of a commitment, but we um, the RT, the Raptor response team members that were out um, managing uh, protests and riots and those types of things for the most amount of time and the most um, close distance, um, we ended up having uh, a seven day restoration project for them. And I'll talk about what some of the classes were here in just a second. Um, that was phase one, we implemented that. Um, we implemented phase two, which was our mobile field force members. Those are members who work on the street in uniform, but normally they're just taking regular police calls for service. They had to go help the RT members um, the most during the protests and riots, things like that which is challenging for them. They get less training in it um, and they have a little bit less uh, safety equipment. And that's also a deviation from what they normally do and not necessarily something that they volunteered for. So um, pretty impactful for some of them, um, especially some of the members working downtown at Central Precinct or getting sent downtown to work at Central Precinct from other um, parts of the city. Um, some of them were having a hard time even just getting into work safely or getting out of work safely. And so that was a challenge for them. Um, the third and final phase is our professional staff. Fuck you. Also our command staff. And um, some of our professional staff, they weren't out necessarily every day on the front line. Fuck me, Daddy. Dealing with protesters and things like that. Uh, but look at that. Look um, at that. Can somebody check who that is? We're getting some... We're working on okay. it. Okay, I didn't wasn't sure if anybody else heard it. Yeah, okay. thank you. Sorry mm -hmm. about that. No worries. We can't control it all. Please continue. No problem. Um, so the classes that our members got is right here. Um, the Rapid response team folks got a much more extended one. Um, the rest of our members are got or did receive or are going to receive a 10 hour day. Um, talked about financial wellness. Um, HQPT, who are physical therapists, came in and they did a uh, mobility assessment and then gave them some training on how to stretch and how to be um, stronger. Um, we had Stephanie Kahn and a few other mental health professionals come in and give them a two hour block on resilience and stress. Uh, Tim Musgrave came back and gave them, for the RT uh, group, a class on mindfulness and meditation. I ended up giving that for the mobile field force group. I also then gave a class on alcohol and a class on sleep. And then Amy gave a class on 
um, control versus influence, um, the things in our lives that we can control versus the things that we can't and what to do with those things that we can't control. And then also gave them additional resources, things that could help them and more reminders to um, reach out for help if it was needed and what type of help was there when they do need it. Moving on, is there any questions about the wellness restoration project? Okay, um, one of the things we did with that, um, we, have, we did bring in outside instructors, um, which is always, there's always a cost associated. Uh, we actually approached FPDNR, which is the Police and Fire Disability Board. Um, they are uh, the group that deals with officer-related injuries. If there are stress claims, things like that, they're the ones that pay and cover those. Um, so they are willing to spend some money in a preventative fashion trying to uh, keep some of the stress claims or um, people being off work for things like that, PTSD, et cetera. So they were the ones that them, and I think there was uh, some money from the mayor's office um, that allowed us to pay and bring in some of these outside instructors. All right, moving on. So the future of the wellness program, uh, where we'd like to go and what we're doing right now, we're working on a wellness directive. I sent this out to some of you, hopefully Barb or somebody could send this to the whole group. Uh, it's directive 500.00, it's brand new. There hasn't been a wellness directive before. Um, Ashley Lancaster and the policy team did a great job helping us craft it. And they've put it out once for public review. I don't know if some of you have seen that or not, but the public is able to make comments. There's two different review, review periods. Um, the first period is closed, but there is gonna be another review period. And I will try to have Ashley or someone uh, send it to you all so that obviously this group would probably be very interested in um, being able to make comments and uh, have some input on it. And I sent a um, PDF draft to Barb to hopefully send out and you all can maybe check it out tomorrow. No need to read it right now. Um, we're trying to institutionalize the wellness training time that we talked about. Um, so at the end of this uh, one-year pilot project for each of the groups, how do we institutionalize that so it's not something that goes away? Um, and then how do we increase the amount of options that officers have? Um, that's something I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we do want to increase our work with community advisory groups. Um, we appreciated you all reaching out to us. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say we were totally ready. Um, we were, I was working today on building something like this to be able to share with you all but I don't think anybody's ever ready and the time is now. So we're excited to work with you all. We do really, really appreciate the time and effort on the uh, um, recommendations that you've given us in the past. We're interested in talking with you all about recommendations you might make in the future. Um, and the same with the tra training advisory council and um, other groups. So the next thing we're, we're question, go Can ahead. I go to back row? Ali, did you have something you wanted to say? Can I go to the bathroom? Hello? I guess not. Downtown uh, precinct, that gym by far gets the most amount of use just because there's so many people that work there and we don't really have a good way to um, work through scheduling that. Um, we do have two new classes I told you about. Hopefully you all can still hear me. People are starting to look like I'm zoning out again. Hopefully I'm not. People still hearing me fine. All right. Um, the main thing that we want to do is sleep. Sleep is one of the most critical things. Um, it's obviously somewhat complicated. I wasn't a sleep expert prior and it wasn't an easy thing to just tackle. So we um, worked on those other classes that we talked about, um, stress and resilience, mindfulness, cardiac health, and nutrition, and now we're finally ready to tackle sleep. Um, Todd and I and one of our training division analysts is uh, working with uh, Washington State University and OHSU trying to figure out a long-term plan for educating our members about sleep, um, allowing them to be involved in doing sleep studies if that's something that they need to do, and then give them as much um, education about uh, sleep as you can. We have talked to other agencies. I know that there are some that have massively reconfigured their shifts to get people better sleep and have more sleep through the night. Um, that's definitely something that we're all interested in. 
Uh, we don't want to have members at work driving cars around quickly, making forced decisions, things like that, um, that are tired. So it's obviously a very important um, topic for us. We're really excited to move forward with it. The other topic that we want to move forward with is alcohol. Um, so we're thinking for in-service 2020 or 2022, um, it's going to be sleep and alcohol are going to be the two um, topics. We we'll talk about alcohol guidelines for healthy life, um, reinforcing awareness of how to seek help, and obviously trying to get members that do need help to um, reach out and ask for it, remove any stigma from people um, reaching out and asking for it. And then also one of the biggest things is how much it impacts your sleep. So those kind of go hand in hand and seem like two topics to provide at the same time. Uh, peer wellness coaching, that's another thing we'd like to work on is allowing members to get certified in something. We have to figure out um, what class or what certifying body we would use. Um, but obviously fitness is on there. Um, having members that are peer fitness coaches, that's something the Fire Bureau did. They had a bunch of members get certified in being peer fitness coaches. And so if another member wants to know how to work out or help work out a fitness routine, they can go to a peer without having to bring in an outside expert, which is more expensive, et cetera. Obviously the whole peer wellness coaching thing we're hoping would be also um, something that benefits and motivates our members maybe to stay. Um, I know there's not a lot of other agencies that allow members to get training like this and then turn around and spend um, work time training other members. But obviously we're looking for every avenue that we can to recruit and retain members that we do have. Um, nutrition's important, um, sleep, uh, meditation, and then obviously financial um, coaches are what we would like to get people certified in. There's a number of ways um, that we get them a certification that's not hugely expensive and then they can turn around and uh, share that information with other members. Um, last but not least, um, integrating wellness and EAP. Um, we're really excited to have both programs working side by side. They overlap a lot, they dovetail. Um, but they obviously are two different entities also. Um, EAP is very confidential. EAP has um, several different things that Todd or I can talk about. Um, I know somebody asked about peer, the peer support group um, where members are trained and when other members need help, they can reach out to them. Um, things like that are obviously a little bit different than the wellness program. Um, but we also think that the more that we promote and encourage and get members working on their own wellness, um, the less work EAP is gonna to have to do on the back end where people are maybe struggling or having alcohol problems or PTSD. Um, we frequently encourage members to make a connection with a mental health counselor. And even if we tell them, even if you're not struggling right now, this is obviously a challenging job or can be a challenging job. You might see all sorts of difficult things in your career. And at some point you might feel like they're starting to pile up and you wanna go talk to somebody. Wouldn't it be better if you already had a connection with somebody and you already knew who you were going to call as opposed to starting that process once you are maybe under a little bit of emotional load. That is 15 minutes left. Todd, before we turn it over for questions, is there anything you missed or anything that uh, you want to say about the wellness or EAP program? Then we'll turn it over for questions. Um, what's that sorry my Todd anything else you want to say about EAP uh, before we turn it over for questions oh sorry I keep getting uh, my internet is unstable and so it fades in and out on me um, no thanks Leo for throwing all that together uh, one of the other programs that I do supervise uh, is the EAP program um, so to have a similar presentation, if, if that's an interest uh, for this group, be happy to facilitate that. Um, Leo highlighted uh, kind of the partnership that wellness and EAP, uh, we hope to, to have with them. And I think the best illustration of that is that restoration project uh, that he covered. Um, and that's, and those type of programs are what we hope to kind of bring um, more of um, as we move forward. So. But if there's specific questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, but thanks, Leo. Thank you. I saw that Anna had a question about um, BOEC. Do our dispatchers get the same um, 
types of things. And I don't know. Um, I know they're a totally different bureau from us. Obviously, I would imagine their job is really stressful and they probably need a lot of the same things. So um, I don't know that though. I think Natalia, did you have a question? Yeah, I've been debating about whether or not to ask it. Um, I am curious if there's someone um, like some sort of mental health services available like throughout the work day. Um, and that I'm framing that from um, like in uh, teaching mindfulness in schools. A lot of schools have found uh, it to be really successful to have a dedicated mindfulness room where people can go to receive reflective listening, um, practice communication skills, gain some self-understanding, just decompress um, a space for silence, you know. Um, and is there is there anything like that, even, you know, maybe more clinical or something um, within space bureau? Uh, no, not yet. We do hope to have that um, on two different levels. Obviously, having somebody around that could teach mindfulness or run meditations or give information on that at any given point would be awesome. Um, we don't have any, that's not anybody's job right now, and it certainly would be um, expensive to hire somebody to do that full time. And then there's an equity piece. Would you have it just during the day? Would you have it during our afternoon shift? Would you have it during our night shift? Um, and then obviously there's 800 employees left. And so like, how would you get around to all of them? Would you go to a different building each day on a different shift? Those are some of the challenges that Todd and I try to work through, especially with limited funding. Um, I love your idea. Uh, we've definitely talked about trying to get a mental health professional full-time who could either do a little bit of like emotional first aid, maybe not have a... Um, you know, full list of folks that they were seeing, um, like a full practice. But um, right now, obviously, there's no money for that. Um, but that's something that we would like. We would like to have somebody around all, as much as possible, maybe even going out to calls or uh, maybe even helping debrief members as their, you know, shift is over if there's been something that's really traumatic. I remember one in particular that EAP went out to where um, it was the central precinct down at Willamette um, Park and a family was trying to put a boat in and ran over one of their children and, and that child got killed and it was horrible. And it was supposed to be a fun day for this family and they went through one of the worst experiences you could ever go through and all the officers that responded there were equally, not equally, but very traumatized. And how do you then right away start doing some kind of emotional first aid? You know, some of those members may have gone and sought counseling for it afterwards. Uh, but I mean, even that, if you haven't already made a connection, that is weeks away from being able to go get into yeah. some kind of And those that. first few so, hours really matter a lot. Like being a, a tip totally on, you know, we're called on scene just for those first two, three hours to, yep. to have someone like another body, another nervous system to help regulate through the experience. It doesn't take a lot of, you know, intellectual knowledge, but probably just a lot of confidentiality. <laughs> yep. And we love all that. Um, we would love more work and uh, information and recommendations and things about that in particular, because we don't necessarily have figured out the best way forward on that, but we do think it's important. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Fitness wearables. Any other questions before the wearables question? <laughs> um, one of the things that I wanted to say, um, someone asked about uh, the BOAC. Uh, I believe it was in May or June, we had a presentation of not only their training, but their support services. So that should be recorded. But then with the, uh, the need to possibly have some uh, mental health and emotional health support on on duty or available for on duty officers. I know we have, it's, it's trauma intervention. Uh, what is it, TIP? Does anybody remember what the P stands for? Is that something you could partner with? Because when I was working for crime prevention, that was somebody that we could call into neighborhoods to help uh, people deal with uh, a large scale trauma. And so maybe you could partner with them if it's a, if it's a municipal service, or maybe EAP might be able to provide some immediate connection. I don't know. Yeah, what is what is the P in TIP, Tara? Yeah, so um, I'm actually a TIP volunteer also, and yeah. um, it stands for Trauma Intervention Program. Uh, and there's a number of people who are have been volunteering for a long time. 
um, that have experienced in corrections also. And so you, you may be able to find like, and take on something like this. Yeah. Definitely something that we'd be interested in. Um, I did see one question about wearables and yes, there's fitness wearables. Yes, we tried to buy some. Um, there's a lot of uh, interesting questions that we hadn't thought of. There's two, two main issues with the wearables. Um, one is if the city buys them and provides them, that information might be something that is public record. And so we're not wanting to give things out to folks who might end up in a use of force or a deadly you know, encounter and then have somebody request the information like, well, how much has Leo slept in the last week? Things like that. Um, there are a variety of other ways for people to track that. Many members already have their own wearables. Um, there's obviously studies that have all sorts of um, protections if it's related to a university or um, some kind of study group. The other issue is how accurate they are. So one of the things like as I um, teach a, a short sleep class, a lot of folks say they track their sleep and I ask what they're using and a lot of them are just wearing Fitbits or um, their Apple watches. And a lot of times that's only tracking movement and historically the data with that is really inconsistent it's guessing and a lot of times people have said and i've reported this myself um had a terrible night's sleep and then checked my watch and it said i had eight full hours of sleep and i know that that's not true but i wasn't moving around very much so it recorded it as good sleep so some of the other trackers are very expensive whoop trackers or rings things like that um, definitely something we're interested in looking into um, there's also even more expensive watches that do a variety of things um, totally interested in it. Um, not something that the city is probably going to provide at this point, um, unless it's in some kind of testing capacity. I know there's other questions piling up in the chat. Um, Amy. Okay. Or I'm sorry. Can I just say, I just posted the link. I'm posting the link for the PSEP recommendation, asking police to call the tip to use tip whenever there is a death um, caused, you know, by a police officer and, and to, tip in to do, be there for the family yes so and that was Both. accepted as a recommendation okay hmm. um anna asks or ann asks do officers work or assign shifts consistently days versus nights do they have to switch sleep schedules quickly the answer is yes um as more and more officers either retire or leave and we're not refilling those roles, it seems like most people in the Bureau, we joke about it, have more than one role. Almost everybody has two roles. They're on some kind of other team. I know that I'm on our tactical team, which is called CERT, so I'm on call. So at any point I could get called out in the middle of the night, day or night. Um, Todd is on our um, crisis negotiation team, could get called out anytime, day or night. So there are many, many instances where people are getting different sleep. I know the majority of our officers work in the street, even if they're not on call, if they work a swing shift or a graveyard shift, they very frequently have court at 8 a.m. So you might've worked until 2 a.m., gotten off, and then your court starts at eight, or you get off at eight and your court starts at eight, and then you have to be back to work that very next night, um, which can really be a challenge for members. There's really no good way around it. Um, and I wouldn't say that we're special. I know there's shift workers of all sorts of other varieties, nurses, doctors, on and on. So it's just a hazard of having uh, an operation that needs to be going 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But it's a huge challenge for us. And some of those members who work shift or uh, afternoon shift and then have court during the day, they also have lives and they want to do stuff that's fun. And they have kids and they have dogs and they have friends. And it's, it's definitely a challenge to get people um, as much sleep as they need. So definitely something we want to focus on in the next year year and a half. Celeste, I see your hand up. Amy, um, we lost Amy, so I'm going to help facilitate for a minute. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I hadn't put my hand down. I'm done. Okay. Are there other questions that people have? If not, we really appreciate the opportunity. Um, we'd love to speak with you all again. Um, obviously, we didn't really get a chance to even talk about some of the things that you might all want to make as recommendations or things that we might ask for as recommendations. Um, I don't know if that's something for another meeting or you know communication offline, but that's definitely um, something we'd be interested in talking with you all more about, especially if there's stuff that we're missing or we're not doing um, that you all might have ideas uh, that we could incorporate. 
Well, you are more than welcome anytime. Um, we've really appreciated, I could think I could speak for the group, has really appreciated the level of engagement from folks. Um, Chase has been a really great partner in being here to help help us all understand. And Amy's back, so I will pass it to Amy. Um, Amy Leo was just, you know, saying they'd like to continue the conversation, maybe have conversations about recommendations that would be helpful. I would absolutely be excited to do that because I'm all about finding solutions to helping folks stay healthy and well. And um, the community wants to get involved. So we'll have more meetings that are safe and hopefully uh, we can get more folks to come. But you guys were awesome. I've learned so much and I definitely want to work on um, developing deeper thought into some of the recommendations, you know, as um, y'all see fit to, you know, implement. Because I really want to sister. make sure implementable, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. So if there are any yep. recommendations that you feel would have more weight or could move faster with our recommendation, uh, be sure to let us know. Let me know. Because I'm willing to move. Thank you very much forward yeah for you thank you very very much we appreciate it so one last thing before we go um there is a settlement um i mean a, a meeting with judge simon coming up in august to review uh some of these things we're going through so jared can you give us a little insight on when that might be happening? Are you there? Jason? Mary Claire could, yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah, no, Amy, Amy, while you're waiting for him to come on, can I also just make a, a quick reminder? I think you all got, um, I noticed yesterday that the Bureau is having its um, 2020 annual um, precinct meetings to discuss the Bureau's uh, annual 2020 annual report, as well as some issues of uh, concern to community members, such as, you know, use of force, um, stops data, the whole bit. And um, did you get one, by the way? Um, no, I did not. Okay. Um, Judith, if you could check, I talked to um, Theo yesterday and he said he would po post it on your website, send the invite to every member and to your listserv, and I would really appreciate if that happened. Um, it's obviously posted to our website. It's going to be, um, you, know, and, you know, invitations are going out all over, but um, it will be uh, two weeks from tonight, tomorrow night, and uh, Thursday night. There will be one for North, one for East, and one for Central. Um, so you can attend one or all this from 6 to 7.30 on Zoom and the link is on the invite. So I would ask you all to um, think about attending or at least spread the word to all your different uh, um, communities and connections. So thank you. I'll go ahead and send out a, a invite to Peace Up Now. So, um, that way folks yeah. All lot of bombers, huh? Boy, somebody's busy wanting to get educated. <laughs> they hang around long enough, they might learn something amazing. And I, I don't know if um, Jared's um, back or not, but the hearing is set for August 24th at 9 a.m. Okay. Uh, we're, still, we're still waiting to hear. We, we believe it's uh, in person. Um, I don't know whether he's going to, the judge will make uh, arrangements for a Zoom portion or not. We haven't heard that yet but we'll keep you posted. But and that's the hearing to determine the, the purpose is to determine whether or not the PSEP is an adequate replacement for the COAB, which was the first iteration of the community, um, the, the community um, engagement of this. Yeah, that's, that's one of the issues. It's the annual compliance hearing where DOJ will you know, speak to their report and the city 
obviously has a response as well as Coco, but we will be asking the judge to finally adopt that amendment. There were six amendments, he adopted five, and that's been hanging out there, as Judith said, for probably a couple of years now. So um, I think clearly you've shown that you're functioning and doing well. So hopefully the judge will see that as well and, and uh, accept that modification or amendment to the settlement agreement. So thank you. Thanks everybody very much for being here. Have a good night. Thank you all for coming and we will plan to further this conversation. So be on the lookout for the emails. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Yeah.